Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar, Accelerated AI Development for Computer Vision on the NVIDIA Jetson with Always AI. Presented by Marty Beard, CEO of Always AI, Scott Miller, Head of Product Management, and Eric Van Bueller, Principal Software Architect. We also have NVIDIA product team listening in and answering questions, so stay tuned for the live Q&A at the end. I wanted to take you through some housekeeping so that the webinar stream goes as smooth as possible. To maximize the quality of this audio, please close any other open applications aside from your current browser window. If you hear any audio sputters or if the slides are seeming to lag, just try refreshing. Um, you can also try opening the event in a different browser window if refreshing doesn't work. If you do encounter any other technical issues, please let us know in the Q&A box and we'll help you get that troubleshooted. All right, now that housekeeping is complete, I'll pass it on to Always AI to start the webinar. Hi, welcome to the webinar, uh, Accelerate AI Development for Computer Vision on the Jetson. I'm Marty Beard, the co-founder and CEO of Always AI, and I'm joined today by Scott Miller, the head of product management, uh, and Eric Van Bueller, Principal Software Architect. We're super excited about the topic today. Uh, it's all about uh, computer vision and accelerating computer vision applications on the edge on Jetson devices. We all know that computer vision is a super powerful technology, and the magic really comes alive uh, on the edge. Uh, and so again, today is a great opportunity for Always AI to showcase how we do that on the NVIDIA Jetson family of products. So let's dive into it and get into the content right now. Let me first tell you about Always AI. We're the leading low-code platform for computer vision application development and deployment on IoT devices. We're a company completely focused on the software developer. And again, we're all about making, uh, creating computer vision applications and getting them built and running on the edge, super easy for the developer. That's all that we do. That's all that we're about. Uh, Always AI is super excited to be able to partner with NVIDIA and showcase how we make that whole process of application creation uh, and deployment on the Jetson family of products uh, super easy and very, very powerful. So let's get into that. Always AI is really composed of three major parts. So let me walk through those really quickly. So the first part is all about uh, models, uh, the AI models, computer vision models that really are the starting point. And what we've done is built a model catalog that provides uh, a whole series of, of models across a variety of categories like object detection and pose estimation and semantic segmentation, et cetera. Uh, models that are really there to uh, get you going as a developer and allow you to really accelerate your application development. Now, we also understand that people want to input their own model, uh, which is totally fine, and we provide that capability for developers to upload uh, their own model. In addition, in this first step, we have a, a model training capability that allows you to train your model, retrain your model, and really optimize the performance of that model for the application that you are, you are creating. So that's the first part of our workflow. The second part is where you actually build the application. And this is a set of APIs, uh, Python library that we've uh, put together to allow, again, you, the developer, to really customize your application, uh, make it do exactly what you want it to do on the edge. And so this is a whole variety of APIs. Uh, for example, uh, APIs that would help you optimize for the angle of a camera. Or for example, if you're doing uh, facial recognition, but you need to input some blurring capability or something like that. There's a whole variety of APIs that we pulled together uh, to make it very easy for a developer to build and customize their application. And again, everything that we do in our workflow uh, is intended 
for a broad variety of developers and developer backgrounds. Uh, so we've worked really hard to make it very clear and very simple, but also highly innovative and uh, effective for a wide variety of, of developers. So that's the second part of this. You've selected your model, you've optimized it, you've now customized your application. But now, most importantly, you want to get it out to the edge. I mean, this is really where the magic of computer vision happens. It's deploying your computer vision application out onto uh, a sensor, uh, onto a camera, onto a drone, onto a, into a car, uh, onto a medical device. There's a whole variety of edge devices uh, that we've um, built the platform to enable you to deploy your application out on the edge with a runtime environment to actually bring that thing alive and start doing the work that you need to do out on the edge. So again, three parts, the model component, the API component, and the deployment component. That's always AI, and that's what we've brought together into our workflow. So now let me uh, introduce uh, Scott Miller, our head of product management. And Scott's going to take us into how we work very closely and specifically with NVIDIA. Scott? Great, thanks Marty, and thanks everyone for joining. So I'm gonna speak for a moment about how we work with NVIDIA and what Always AI adds to uh, the NVIDIA platform. So we do a, uh, we do a couple of things, and, and first of all, I guess I would say you know, because of the, the their performance, the NVIDIA Jetson Nano, TX2, and Xavier are really enablers of computer vision on the edge. And Always AI is an enabling platform for Jetson. So if you're new to Jetson, Always AI will help you get started quickly. Really, you can be up and running, building an application, something productive, something useful, in less than 30 minutes, so really very quick. And if you're lucky enough to already be familiar with the Jetson platform, some of our APIs will help you extend your existing applications. For example, we support spatial AI, we support pose estimation, and our new model retraining tools really can help you tailor uh, your machine learning models to your particular situation. Marty already talked about how it works, um, but let me speak for a moment about the types of things that you can find on the Always AI platform that are specific to NVIDIA Jetson. So we have a number of starter applications. This is how you get up and running so quickly. Uh, again, anything from pose, object detection, object tracking, uh, that have been tailored for the Jetson family. So when you use these starter applications, everything you need is right there in your project. It'll get up and running right away. Uh, we have TensorRT support. So a number of models in the catalog that will run very quickly, they're already optimized uh, for the Jetson family. Um, all of those TensorRT uh, models are used in the starter application, so you're just you're really re ready to go very quickly. Um, and then finally, like we said, we really, between all these things, we help you accelerate your development on Jetson. So looking forward, things you can expect from us uh, relative to the platform are going to be even more starter applications, uh, different types of things, new models, et cetera. So as we add things, we'll continue to add specific support for Jetson. Uh, we'll add specific retraining for TensorRT. So when you retrain a model, you can then optimize it for the Jetson platform. Uh, again, this is really important as you go to production. And then finally, we're excited to be working on additional integration with the EGX uh, platform, more things with a broader, broader Jetson ecosystem. So that's how we work with uh, NVIDIA and Jetson. So I'm going to now turn it over to Eric Van Bueller, who's going to run some code. He's going to go through examples using Jetson boards with the Always AI platform. All the code he's working on is in GitHub. If you go to the GitHub link, uh, you can follow along. We encourage you to do that. And then uh, later on today, we'll be hosting a hacky hour uh, to really answer any Jetson-specific questions you may have as you, as you begin to develop with Always AI and uh, NVIDIA Jetson. Think of these happy hours as like office hours. So open, bring your questions, whatever. Other people will be there asking questions. Everyone is welcome. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, and uh, Eric, over to you. Thank you, Scott. So before I jump into actually running some computer vision apps on these Jetson devices, 
I'm going to do a walkthrough of the Always AI platform and show some of the new and exciting features we've added recently. In my first technical demo, I'll show how easy it is to build and run an application on a Justin Nano, TX2, and Xavier NX with Always AI. In my second technical demo, I'll show an app I've built that I think really demonstrates the benefits of running on a Justin device. For that one, we'll take a closer look at model performance and examine how it impacts the overall performance of the app. So let's get started. So for the platform walkthrough, I'll be going through the dashboard and model catalog, which are on the web, the command line interface, which is on uh, your development computer, and then the Edge IQ Python library, which runs on your Edge device, such as the uh, Jetson devices that I'll be using in the upcoming demos. Um, so first, let's head over to the dashboard. So here we have a bunch of uh, different starter apps to help you get up and running quickly with different computer vision use cases. And this is also where you can manage your projects, models, collaborators, and devices. Next, let's jump over to the model catalog. So right now we have um, models that fit into these four what we call core CV services. And those are object detection, classification, pose estimation, and semantic segmentation. And so the model catalog has a listing of all the models that we support um, in our applications right now. And the neat thing is, is these are all pre-trained networks that are pretty much plug and play into your applications. But you can also bring your own private models and use those. And you can use our retraining tools to uh, retrain existing models to um, fit your use cases a little bit better. So let's take a look at the semantic segmentation models. So uh, what we've done is we've been collecting inference time benchmark data on all these models across the four devices you see in this benchmark um, panel over here. And so what you can do is if, if there's a particular device you're interested in, uh, like for example in Xavier NX, um, you can select that and you will see the models listed in order of the fastest models first. So we have this ResNet 18 Cityscapes model that runs at uh, 18 milliseconds per inference on uh, this engine and accelerator. And so what this means, and uh, let me jump into the details page to go into, uh, go into that. So the details page has um, a bunch more information on the model, but what we can do here is we can get the performance information across all of the uh, devices that we benchmark. And so what we have is uh, what we call an engine and accelerator. And so the engine is the, the software um, library that we're using to perform the inferencing, and the uh, accelerator is the hardware or um, combined with kind of the format in the case of the NVIDIA um, FP16. So um, the DNN engine CPU accelerator um, works across um, most platforms, your laptop, or Raspberry Pi, and we can see we get some baseline numbers there, and we can compare that to if we're running on a Jetson Nano with this model, and we choose um, the DNN CUDA backend with the NVIDIA accelerator, we can get that down to less than 70 milliseconds for the inference. If we jump over to an Xavier NX, we can see that um, that's down to 36 milliseconds, and then if we use NVIDIA FP16 accelerator, less than 20 milliseconds. So that is blazing fast for this model, which is awesome. So that covers everything I wanted to look at at the model catalog. Um, let's head over to the documentation section. So the documentation is where you'll find information on um, setting up your system and your edge devices, and also um, building your Always AI app. So to get started with the CLI, you can head to the development computer setup section, and you'll see that um, it, the setup uh, is slightly different based on your OS. If you're using Windows or Mac, we have a, uh, a download for an installer, which will install the CLI on your system and all of its dependencies. On Linux, it works a little bit differently, and this is how it works not only on, uh, on a laptop, for example, or um, this is also how it works on uh, an Edge device. So if you wanted to work directly on your Jetson Nano, you could follow these instructions to set up the CLI on your Nano and get working right on there without a separate um, computer. And so how this works is that you install the CLI with NPM and then you install Docker. And Docker is um, what will be used to run your app on the device. So instead of running natively, you'll be running in a Docker container. So once you've got that set up, um, you can jump into building an Always AI app. 
And so this just briefly covers some of the different important parts of building an app. We talked about the core CV services on the model catalog, so those same four have um, some different APIs that you'll work with. Um, another really important part is how are you getting your media? So you might want to load some images, you might want to get a video stream from a camera or for a file, and um, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a bit. Um, after that, you get a results object back. Um, you want to do some post-processing and you might want to smooth some things out or better understand how objects are interacting. Um, so that would be included in object tracking. And then we also provide a bunch of uh, tools and um, different ways to analyze and improve the performance of your app. So we have um, uh, a a web app uh, called the streamer which um, brings up the camera feed that your device is seeing and, and some text data that you're feeding through um, and I'll go through um, some of these uh, in a bit such as changing the engine and accelerator that I covered in the model catalog and um, uh, yeah so let's let's jump in let's head over and look at object detection so for object detection and just to preface it, all of the um, core CV services uh, kind of work in a similar way. So what you do for object detection, what you'll do for semantic segmentation will be very similar. So you've picked out your model and you uh, provide the model ID as the input to your core CV service. And from there, you load it with an engine and accelerator. And so in this example, we're loading it with the D DNN engine. Um, in the later apps I'll be showing, we'll also load the DNN CUDA engine and the TensorRT engine. Um, and then finally, you'll run the inference which, in which you get back a uh, results object. If you've worked with you know, some of this, these inferencing tools outside of our platform, you're used to getting maybe a NumPy array back or something like that in Python. Um, in our case, we've tried to make it a little bit more user-friendly, so we do some post-processing on those results and we provide this results object back, and so in object detection, uh, we return the object detection prediction, and I will go into a little bit more detail there. So this uh, prediction um, represents kind of a single object that's been detected, and so it has a label, an index, which is not commonly used unless you don't have labels. Um, the bounding box, and then the confidence of that detection. And so this makes it really easy to do things like um, filtering through for a certain label and things like that. So then you can do things like draw the bounding boxes on an image really easily. And so that's most useful for just showing things while you're kind of in the building phase. And that's what we'll see in the uh, demos I'll show. Let's take a quick look at uh, some of the results. So. We have a description here of the object detection results and all the things you can do. Um, there's a couple of different features such as um, filtering the predictions by label or by the area of the bounding box. Um, so that can be really useful there. And you can also, um, with bounding boxes, do a few different things such as compute the distance between different bounding boxes, get the intersection of two bounding boxes, um, things like that. So. The next important part would be capturing video from a camera. And so uh, there's a bunch of different ways to get uh, video streams to a device. Um, the two very common ones that I use are using a USB webcam or a CSI ribbon camera. And so depending on your device, um, you'll use the different video stream classes to get those video streams. So you can see for a USB webcam, uh, the webcam video stream is pretty much the universal class to use. So that's really easy, but it gets a little trickier when um, you're using a CSI uh, ribbon camera or a built-in camera. And so on um, <clears throat> Mac and Windows and Raspberry Pi, you can still use the webcam video stream. On the NVIDIA Jetson, you have to use the Jetson video stream, which um, communicates with the uh, driver on the, on the Jetson itself. And other devices, we have a GStreamer video stream uh, that you can use as well. We also support the RealSense camera um, across all of those devices and IP video streams. So all of those are supported um, uh, on these systems. And then the general usage we'll see in the app is quite simple. You just set it up um, uh, with, you know, if it's a camera, you might have to provide the camera index. IP video stream takes in the, the IP address. Um, and then you can just read frames. Uh, and, and 
we'll see that in the app in the upcoming uh, demo. So another thing that I wanted to quickly go through was changing the engine and accelerator. And so we support um, a few different engines and each of those has some different accelerators that it can run on. And so the base engine that uh, we support is OpenCV's DNN engine. And that one's nice because it can run across um, all these different platforms, Mac, Windows, and many model frameworks work on it. So it's a good baseline to, to get started with if you're initially building out your app on your laptop, for example. Um, and then from there, um, you can use the DNN CUDA engine, which um, supports many of the models that would also run on the DNN engine. And then what we're, we've added support in um, for TensorRT, and we're still bringing in support for more models there. But this is um, kind of where we see the really high performance applications. Right now we support Onyx models and pose estimation. We're bringing in object detection and also doing some model conversions ourselves to get TensorRT models out there. And we'll see um, some of the performance of that in the upcoming demos as well. And then we also support the OpenVINO engine um, for NCS2 and other Myriad chips. So I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to um, go through here. So for this first demo, I wanted to do um, kind of a simple demo that would really show the speeds that you get on the Jetson devices. Um, and so this is just a really simple app and what it's gonna do is loop a crosswalk video uh, that just performs detections and displays that in the streamer. And so the first thing I need to do is just clone this. And this is on our public GitHub, so um, anyone that's watching, you can go head over to our GitHub page and clone this yourself and give it a try. The video is included, so um, that should make it easy. And let's do this. Cool. So before we uh, get too far, I wanted to look a little bit at the application structure. So um, the first thing you see is this app.json, which is a configuration file generated by our uh, CLI. And we don't need to dig into that for now. Um, the next thing you see is the app.py, which is the source code for application. And then the video crosswalk.m4v and a Docker file. Um, the license in readme, and then a requirements.txt file, which is the Python dependencies file. So if we had any Python dependencies that we wanted to bring into this application that aren't in the, the standard library, um, you can add those to the requirements.txt, and the CLI will install them when it installs your app automatically. I want to take a quick look at the Docker file. Um, because this Docker file is used by the CLI to build the runtime environment for your application. And so we haven't really made any modifications to this particular Docker file. Um, if you wanted to install system dependencies, you could here. Uh, but this one's simply getting the base EdgeIQ image from the AlwaysAI Docker Hub repo. And the one tricky part that I wanted to go over here is this AlwaysAI hardware argument. And what we've done is we've built Docker images for a bunch of different devices and architectures. And so the CLI, when it, when it connects to the target hardware, it determines what kind of hardware that is and uh, populates this argument with the value to get the right Docker image. And so in our case, I'll be working with all, of, uh, all of these Jetson devices. And so always AI hardware will be populated with Jetson and that will get the Jetson base Docker image. And the final piece here is the Edge IQ version, which is manually set to 0.16.0. .0 and um, you can lock down on a version if you want and then follow along with our releases and upgrade when you see those releases. Alternatively, you can set it to latest and pull down the latest whenever um, you want to pull in an upgrade. So a couple different options there. Now let's jump into the uh, source code. There's the initialization step and what we're doing here is like I showed in the documentation, we're setting up this object detection object and we're passing in the model ID, always AI slash mobile net SSD. And on a Jetson device, we're gonna load that to DNN CUDA engine, 
Otherwise, we'll load a DNN. And this is nice because this means I can run it on my laptop, which we don't currently support DNN CUDA on right now, and then go and install it on a Jetson without changing any code, and it'll be the optimized version on uh, the Jetson device. And we have some print statements here just to kind of confirm that what we thought happened actually happened. So we'll see the model that was loaded, the engine and accelerator, so we can determine that it correctly loaded it to DNN CUDA on the Jetson. And then the labels that we have uh, for that model, um, which is just nice to see if you're switching between different models, you can print out the labels. Um, and then we'll be tracking the FPS of our app using the FPS tool. Next, um, we're loading a file video stream, and uh, what this does is uh, it's, it's simply loading in this uh, crosswalk video to play back. But there's one extra step here. We're setting this play real-time flag to true. And so usually when you would play back a video, um, if you set this to false or you just leave it to its default, um, you would get every single frame and perform inference on it. And what you would see in your in the streamer is that the video would play back really slowly because the inferencing, depending on your device, slows it down to be slower than 30 FPS or whatever the video was encoded at. And this play real-time flag, what it does is it makes the video playback act more like a video stream from a camera. Um, and in that way, Instead of giving you every single frame, it plays the video back frame by frame at the encoded frame rate and drops frames that aren't read. And then we're also setting up the streamer, um, which is our uh, visual debugging tool. So the next thing we'll do is we jump into a loop where we're just going to continuously read frames and perform inferencing. And I've done a little um, try accept here to restart the video every time the video ends. And it's kind of a short video clip, so this makes it easier to see what's going on just because it's gonna loop the video as long as we want and then we can just stop it when, when we're tired of watching. The next step here is to perform the inference. So we're passing in the frame and a confidence level. And, um, and then we're simply drawing the results on an image and generating some text to be displayed on the streamer. And then sending that data to the streamer updating our FPS, and then the streamer has a stop button, and if we want to be able to use that to stop our app, we can uh, call this check exit function and break out of the, the while loop. So let's uh, install and run this on some devices. Okay. So the command AAI app configure lets us um, select or create a new project. I'll create a new one called NVIDIA Demo. And from there, I get to choose where I want to run the device. And let's run it on a Nano first. So I have a bunch of devices already set up, so I'm going to use this Nano Test 1. and uh, we'll use the default installation directory. Cool, and so before we actually run it, I wanted to do one more thing. I wanted to look at the performance of the particular model we're using. So um, to get that model populated up into the dashboard, um, I'll use the AI app models add command. Cool, so let's head over to the dashboard. And we should see our new project showing up. All right, NVIDIA demo, there it is. And we have MobileNet SSD added here. So clicking that brings us to the details page. And uh, from here we can look at what we expect to see um, in the performance of this application. So we can see on a Jetson Nano, we're gonna see a little bit better than 100 milliseconds um, inference time on DNN CUDA engine, uh, Jetson TX2, we'll see around 70 milliseconds. And on Xavier NX, we'll see 28 milliseconds on uh, DNN CUDA, and then 23 on if we use NVIDIA FP16. Um, and I don't have the app set up to do that, but uh, you can try that on your own if you want to, uh, if you want to see those numbers. So let's head back. And uh, now to install the application on our device, we use the command AI app install.
And this command does a few things. Um, it first copies the uh, um, the code and configuration and everything from our working directory to the installation directory on the device. Then it builds the, the base Docker image on the device and installs the models um, and the Python virtual environment used for the Python dependencies of the app. So now that we've installed it, uh, we can run with AI app start. And we should see our logs come up in a moment and uh, as well as the link for the streamer. So if we click on that link, we'll get our video clip up here and we can see we expected around 100 uh, milliseconds. It looks to be running a little bit quicker right now, which is nice. And But we can see that it's a little bit uh, choppy still. Um, and uh, I mean, one thing also to note is that this is a pretty busy, um, a busy scene, a lot of people walking by, and so there are a lot of boxes here. Um, one thing you can do is filter for different, uh, different uh, labels, such as person, bicycle, um, if you wanted to kind of isolate one part of it. And also you could use some uh, object tracking to smooth this out so it wouldn't be as jumpy and, and stuff like that. So a couple different things you could do. But let's try running this on a TX2 and see um, what it looks like. To change devices, all we need to do is run the AI app configure command again. So let's go ahead and do that. And like I said before, I already have a bunch of devices set up. Um, I'm very lucky to have many uh, Jetson devices sitting around me right now. So we'll go ahead and move over to the TX2. We'll stick with the default. And the next step is to install the app. And once that wraps up, we will uh, start the app and uh, bring up the streamer again. All right. So we're seeing about uh, 70 milliseconds, which is what we expected from the benchmarking data. And uh, the video playback here is, uh, at least to me, noticeably smoother than what we saw previously, um, which really wasn't too bad um, for, for this uh, model especially. Um, the inferencing overall is pretty quick, but the smoothness here has definitely improved. So let's jump over to the, to the uh, Xavier NX and, and see what that looks like. So we'll run AI app configure again. And this time I will select the Xavier NX. And then we'll go through the install step again. All right, and now let's start the app. We are seeing uh, 20 milliseconds inference time here, and this video playback uh, looks pretty much real time. I I'm seeing no uh, noticeable choppiness to it or anything. Of course, the boxes are still bouncing around uh, quite a bit. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, that's going to be pretty much avoidable without some uh, post-processing. All right, let's... Uh, Let's wrap this up. So, um, so for this part of the, the demo, we saw that this very low code object detection app that's basically running inferences, displaying that on a web page, run across a Jetson Nano, a TX2, and an Xavier NX. And I wanted to show how easy it is to switch devices and to optimize for specific devices. In this case, loading the model to the DNN CUDA engine on Jetson devices. So let's move on to the next demo. The, the next demo I wanna go through is an app that I put together uh, earlier this week um, that uh, counts workout repetitions, in this case, specifically jumping jacks. 
And the motivation is that many of us are working from home right now. And I, for one, feel like I haven't been getting up and moving around enough. So um, I decided to make this app that counts jumping jacks. And so it can kind of act as like a jumping jack coach for you to, uh, to get you motivated. And so one of the key parts of this app, though, is that um, you need to be able to collect enough data points um, in each repetition to actually determine that a jumping jack occurred. So if you think about um, someone doing jumping jacks, maybe the, the normal pace of a jumping jack might be somewhere around one per second. And so to accurately understand if we completed a single jumping jack, we need at least three or four points in each of those um, uh, periods of the jumping jack, probably more. The more we can get, the better, um, especially because these detections aren't always, you're not always going to get all the points. Sometimes the, the model won't be able to find one of the wrists, for example. And so you have to use the points around that to understand um, where the wrist might be at this point in time. And luckily, jumping jacks are periodic. Um, they're a periodic motion. So that makes it a little bit easier. And what we're doing here is using the human pose model, which is an onyx model. And the neat thing about that is that we can convert that to TensorRT um, on the device and run that using the super high performance TensorRT engine to get amazing performance with uh, the Jetson devices. And I'll, I'll show this application on the Xavier NX. And one other thing is um, I've decided to um, use a video for this, a video that I collected earlier while I was building the application, just because it makes it a little easier to, to demonstrate. But you can certainly use this on a, on a, a live video stream and uh, if you're interested in seeing, uh, maybe learning a little bit more about um, how I built it specifically, um, we'll be doing a hacky hour this afternoon where I'll be going into it in more detail. So join us there and, um, and you can learn a little bit more about this specific application. Um, so let's jump over to the uh, console. So I've already cloned this because I have the video that I captured in there. And so if we take a look at this uh, app structure, um, it's similar to what we saw previously. There's a few more configuration files because I've already gone through the, uh, the installation of this. And then there's my jumping jacks video, um, which is sadly not included in the GitHub repo because I, I didn't feel like I needed uh, to put a goofy video of me doing jumping jacks out there. But uh, you can make your own video. <laughs> and um, let's take a quick look at the source code. I know I'll, I'm not going to go into too much depth here, but I wanted to kind of give a high level view. So I've added a few parameters um, to help you uh, use the app in different ways. And so one common thing uh, with the camera video stream is changing the index. And so I've made a parameter to be able to set that at the command line, um, which is neat because that means you don't have to reinstall the device if you want or reinstall the app if you want to use a different camera. And that can be pretty common. For example, the Xavier NX I have in front of me, um, I have both a USB webcam and a ribbon CSI camera plugged in. And so uh, if I want to test it on a different camera, I just switch that index. The parameter I'll be using in my demo is this video file parameter, which kind of uh, takes over from the camera video stream, replaces it with a file video stream, and loads the video file that I have. And one thing to note is that that video file needs to be in the app directory if you want to run it on a target device because only videos in that app directory will get copied over to the target device. And finally, I added this debug flag, which can be really helpful if you're testing it in some different scenarios. And um, what it does is it collects all of the data that it gets from the different poses and dumps that to a CSV file so you can do some post-processing on it. And this was really useful in my testing where you go and uh, you, maybe you go and do 50 jumping jacks, but uh, it comes back and says you did 49. You want to figure out what went wrong there, uh, try and figure out which one it missed and why, and that can help you tweak the algorithm uh, to improve it in, in special cases that maybe weren't uh, considered in this initial implementation. And so I wanted to step into how we handle this video file parameter. What I'm doing here is that if there is a video file passed in, I'm setting up a video stream class to be file video stream, and then setting up the args in this dictionary. Otherwise, I'm using a webcam video stream with the camera that was provided. 
And um, also, just like in the last app, I'm uh, loading a different engine for jets and devices. I'm loading the TensorRT engine, otherwise I'm loading the DNN engine. And so, and that's helpful because I can then run this on my laptop, see the performance, then install it on a Jetson device and, uh, and see how it runs there. And then the bulk of the work is done in this jumping jacks tracker object. So feel free to jump into the GitHub repo, dig into that yourself. I'll go into more detail on that later in the afternoon. Um, and then compared to the last app, our loop here looks pretty much the same. Um, the only difference is that we're sending in our pose information to this update function and then putting the count of jumping jacks in the streamer. So um, that pretty much covers the main loop of this app. Let's go ahead and take a look at a little bit closer look at the model itself. If we jump back to the dashboard, We can head over to the projects, and I've already set up a project for the jumping jacks counter. Uh, and then it has the model human pose already added. So here we can take a look at what we expect to see and see if um, the model and uh, device can meet the performance specs that we need. So what we're seeing here is that um, for the Tensor RT engine, we're seeing less than 100 milliseconds. So that's going to give us, um, well, if we just took the inverse of this, we'd see around 10 frames per second. But um, it's important to note that the results for um, human pose and the pose estimation models in particular look a lot different than what you would get back from object detection, for example. And it requires another layer of pose processing that can also be quite intensive. So we have to take these numbers um, a little bit loosely and look at this as kind of a best case and uh, and so in this case you know the 10 frames per second is probably good enough and we're going to see a little bit less than that um, so that's still probably pretty good if we bump up to a tx2 we're down to 40 milliseconds and on an xavier nx which is what i'll be running we're at 30 milliseconds and so that is blazing fast for this model and definitely going to give us the performance we need, especially if you compare to running this directly on the CPU, which is over one second. Um, that's definitely not going to meet our requirements. So, and we can even give that a try to see how that uh, how our our app holds up to that scenario. Now that we've looked at those numbers, let's jump back. Uh, first, run AI app configure. And we'll select the Xavier NX that I have. And then after that, we'll install the app. And then the next step is to start the app, and we need to make sure we start it with the uh, video file. And so to pass arguments through to the app, we have to put a, uh, two dashes and then a space, and that tells the CLI that the following arguments are to be passed down to the application. So then we have video file, and that's my jumping jacks video. And so a quick note about this video. Um, so this video is just uh, here in my office, but uh, uh, so I did 10 jumping jacks in this video, and um, there's a, a little delay at the beginning because the loading can take some time uh, when it starts, so that way we don't miss any of them, and hopefully I bring up the, uh, the page quick enough to see the first one, but we'll see, and we can count them and make sure that the app is counting correctly. Um, and then another thing to note is because we're using the Onyx human pose model, it'll get com converted to TensorRT at runtime, um, which enables flexibility in going between different devices, but also is a bit of a pain because of this uh, conversion step. And so we also have the pre-converted models available in the catalog. If you know, for instance, you're only going to be working on the Xavier NX, um, just use that model and you won't have to go through this step of um, building. So we'll let this uh, wrap up. It, it shouldn't take too much longer.
Cool. And now let's bring up the streamer. Hopefully we're quick enough. Okay, there we go. So now we're counting jumping jacks. Doing my best jumping jacks form. And we got all ten of them. Cool. All right. Well, let's just try a little experiment and um, just run it on the DNN engine and see how that looks. And remember that we're playing this video back with the play real time flag, so it's going to look uh, the same way if we, as if we had a camera video stream coming in and we were working at that uh, at that speed. So let's jump into the app um, and let's just comment all that out. So there we go. So now we're going to load onto the DNN engine, and to get that updated, we'll just run app install again. We'll see how many jumping jacks we count this time. I'm I'm interested to see. <laughs> Let that install. And then the next step is to do the start with our video file. I'll try and be quick clicking this so we don't miss any of the video. All right, so there we go. 1.2 seconds, just like we expected. And basically just a blur right now. All right, we got one, we got two. Is that already the uh, the end? Oh man, yeah. Somehow that got two uh, two jumping jacks out of that, but two out of ten that is not a passing score. So in this demo, we got to see how to use the Tensor RT engine on the Jetson devices to really get the top level performance out of these apps. And we're currently working on bringing in a whole bunch more models into Tensor RT. So um, I'm really excited about this to kind of see what, what performance we get across a bunch of these other different object detection models and really pushing the limits of these applications. So yeah, that wraps up my technical demos. Thank you so much for watching and hanging in there. Okay, and, thanks, and Eric. So as you can see, it's super easy to deploy a computer vision application like the Jumping Jack app on a NVIDIA Jetson device. And in fact, uh, we can really get some performance improvements by leveraging uh, the Always AI platform uh, with the, these great NVIDIA Jetson devices. Uh, it really showcases how powerful computer vision can be on the edge. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, what we suggest is that you pick up a Jetson device and, you know, identify a computer vision use case and start developing. Uh, you can get more information at developer.nvidia.com uh, as well as from the Always AI uh, NVIDIA landing page. Secondly, I'd like to mention that uh, we have a what we call a hacky hour every Thursday and actually later today. Um, we can all get moving, so to speak, and really dive into the jumping jack uh, application. We could all use that right now these days. So let's, you know, we'd love to have you join us, and uh, we're going to dive right into it and get into the details. And it's a it's a great way to segue from today's webinar and get right into into actual application development. And then, of course, you can always go to uh, our website. Uh, where we've worked really hard to bring together a great set of docs and blogs with starter applications and suggested apps, other things you can do, as well as our YouTube channel, uh, where it's all about providing you the insight and the learning that you need to really explore this world of computer vision on the edge. Thanks for joining the webinar. We're going to get right now into some interesting Q&A, and we look forward to answering the questions, so let's dive into it right now. Thank you to the Always AI team for a great presentation. We've received a lot of great questions throughout this webinar, and members from both Jetson and Always AI product team will take 10 to 15 minutes to try and answer as many questions as possible. So with that, let's get started. All right, well, we have a bunch of uh, really good questions, so I'm going to jump right in and uh, try and answer them. So thanks again for everybody that uh, watched, and you can continue to add questions, I think. So um, go ahead if you have any follow-ups. 
So uh, we received uh, several questions about the real sense on uh, jets and devices, and that's a the whole depth uh, sensing is a really interesting area that um, with the performance of the jets and devices, um, you can really make some cool apps there. So uh, we do support the real sense camera, and uh, we had a question on the format. Um, so we're bringing in uh, just like any other camera that you would attach to it um, right now. You're just getting kind of an um, uh, kind of like an MJPEG or uh, the NumPy array of the image in, but we also provide a depth map. And if you head over to our documentation, um, you can see some of the APIs that you can work with there, such as um, you can get a region of interest within your frame if there's a certain depth that you're interested in. Um, you can compute the distance from the camera to an object or even compute the distance in 3D space between two different objects. So um, a lot of really cool stuff you could do um, with the RealSense camera. And so, all right, I'll move on. Uh, we had a, a question about how we compute the inference time and if it correlates to the image size being inspected. And um, so right now, the inference time is, we've tried to make it purely um, the time it takes to do the forward pass on the network. So um, what that means is that all of the pre-processing and post-processing that gets done um, is outside of that inference time computation. So we do a resizing of the image before that would, that would be impacted by the size of the image. Um, that is not included in the inference time. So um, there is an extra step to kind of better understand your application on the FPS side, and that is kind of measuring what that overall time is. Um, the inference time is only one, one part of the processing that would happen. Um, so, all right. Um, I will move on. And uh, so we had another question about the uh, NVIDIA Docker extensions. And so um, if I understand the question correctly, I think uh, what, uh, well, what I can say is that we are, our, our um, Edge IQ based image for jets and devices is uh, based on the NVIDIA Docker image that's, that's provided by NVIDIA. And what we're doing is we're taking that and installing our dependencies on top of it. So just a few, uh, a few Docker layers on top of that, and then uh, you get the, the Edge IQ image. So, um, so yeah, yeah I, uh, like Eric, I think, yep, yeah, uh, uh, go ahead, Amit. Said, yeah, the, yeah, I was just saying that to add to that, yeah, uh, immediate Docker extension is the only way to access the GPU from the Docker, and since the always AI, you know, uh, Docker apps they use the GPU, it is, it is leveraging our Docker extension and that's underneath. All right, thanks, Amit. Um, yeah, so, and then kind of going back to when I described the Docker file, um, identifying the, the hardware device is kind of a key part of getting that to work because if you've used the NVIDIA uh, Docker um, image, then you know that you have to set uh, um, the runtime to NVIDIA, and then there's other steps to get the camera uh, working correctly if you want to access the Argus driver. So um, a lot of important steps there in, uh, in, in working with the, the Jetson devices. Um, I had a couple questions about uh, the Xavier AGX and uh, why that wasn't included. And it wasn't included simply because I don't have one. <laughs> um, I would love to get one, so that's probably on the, on the map, uh, on the roadmap ahead. Um, but uh, since the Docker image, and maybe the NVIDIA folks can, can chime in on this too, but I believe that um, it, since we're using the, the Jetson base image, uh, that works across the, the Nano TX2 and Xavier NX, I imagine that it probably works on the Xavier AGX as well. So um, I, if you have an AGX, an Xavier AGX, I encourage you to, to give it a try and let us know how it works. I'm excited to hear. So um, yeah, Amit, do you have anything to add there or? Yes, absolutely. You're absolutely right, right? That, that's, uh, you know, uh, given that we use the same software uh, across all our platforms, uh, you know, all our even any container that you download, even from our NVIDIA GPU cloud, it can it can be run across all the products. So uh, I'm pretty sure you will be able to run this on the AGX Xavier without any problem. All right, and NX is great. That's uh... derivative of the same Xavier architecture. So uh, I'm pretty confident this will work. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So if if uh, if um... 
anyone in the developer community gives that a try, we'd love to uh, hear about it on our Discord channel. Um, so uh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, let me see. So we had, um, so there is a, a question here. It seems pretty uh, specific to um, kind of some of the specific, some of the specifics of the um, Xavier uh, boards and stuff like that. Um, Amit, do you want to uh, uh, take a shot at that one? Um. So can you read out the question uh, specifically? Uh, yeah. Answer that. Sure. Um, so it says I'm uh, looking at switching from an NVIDIA GTX 1050 Ti in an ECU to an Xavier or Xavier NX. Fortunately, the inference uh, was twice as fast on the GTX 1050 Ti in comparison to the Xavier dev board for the networks we tested. I expect that the Xavier should outperform a general purpose GPU, which is not the case. Uh, what am I missing here, and what uh, gain should I expect using the DLAs and Tensor RT on an Xavier in comparison to the uh, 1050 Ti? Yeah, so, in, in, you know, uh, as you know, the Xavier uh, and the embedded platforms are uh, less performance than the bigger GPUs because they are designed for, uh, you know, uh, constrained environments. Uh, however, you know, using some of the tools that we provide, like transfer learning toolkit, which can help you with the quantization uh, as well as the, you know, pruning of the models, we see that most of our customers who start with the D big DGPU are able to bring down their application to the to the embedded platform. And as Eric mentioned earlier, the other thing is FPS, right? So uh, you know, your inference time uh, is one piece, but your end-to-end -end pipeline of pre-processing, post-processing. Uh, that can be really well optimized on the Xavier itself because you know we have dedicated hardware engines for encode, decode, the scaling, and whatnot. So uh, if yeah, with, with the quantization, if you're not using in quantization, something to look at because Xavier has a tensor course. So look into quantization, look into transfer learning toolkit for pruning, and with that, uh, we hopefully expect you to get the performance that you need. Thank you, Amit. Um, yeah, and and that makes a lot of sense. And it's always good to remember that these um, uh, these edge devices, e even the Jetsons, are designed for um, for being on the edge with a lot of uh, constraints put on the the power usage and stuff like that. So um, so yeah, it is it can be hard to compare between um, like full desktop or server systems uh, sometimes, but. Uh, um, if you're looking at putting something out that's going to be running on an independent power source or something, uh, a lot of those bigger uh, boards don't make a lot of sense in that scenario. So, um, cool, cool. So we have a question here about um, build, designing a network with uh, um, TensorFlow and Keras and then converting to TensorRT. And I actually, um, I don't have direct experience in going through that process, but um, any Onyx model, uh, the conversion in TensorRT is really straightforward. So um, if you can get to, an on to the Onyx format, that makes your life easier. I'm not sure if you can from Keras very easily. Um, like I said, I haven't done that myself. Um, but I don't know, if anyone on the, uh, on the call has any uh, more insight there, I would love to hear it. Check in, anyone, yeah, so anyone for, tried this before? Yeah. Yeah, for, for I mean, uh, the recommended path is to go from TensorFlow to Onyx and then Onyx to TensorRT, that's right. And okay. we are continuing to work with TensorFlow team to make sure that the, you know, the, the TensorFlow to Onyx conversion works well. And we are investing heavily also on the Onyx parser to make sure the latest ops are supported. Okay. Great, great. Um, let me see. So we have, okay. We have a question about uh, TensorFlow Lite models. Uh, currently, we don't support TensorFlow Lite. It's something uh, that, we're, um, that we're looking at for the future, uh, but uh, currently, yeah, not supported. So I think I have time for uh, one last question. So there's a question here. Um, that says, any work uh, on pose estimation of objects not being human? 
And uh, right now, the only pose estimation model that we support is human pose. And up in our catalog, we have that in a few other uh, formats, but it's essentially the same uh, model um, in all of those formats. And we're really interested in bringing in other pose estimation models, but at this time, human pose is all we have. So uh, we'd love to hear what kind of pose estimation models that, uh, uh, um, that you have. Uh, any ideas that you have, jump into our Discord channel and let us know, and that will help us uh, figure out what, uh, what we'd like to bring in next. So thank you, everyone. I think that, that wraps up your, uh, the, the Q&A. And uh, sorry if I didn't get to your question. We, we had a lot of really good questions. So um, I think that I will uh, pass it off. So thanks again, everybody. Okay, well, we wanted to give a big thank you to Always AI team for presenting this webinar. An on-demand version will be available shortly and can be accessed using the same link um, that, you were that you received in your emails. So thank you again for joining us and hope everyone stays safe and healthy.